Hey students, today we are talking about spatial arrangements in the Nemeth Code. In this context, spatial arrangements just refers to that we're dealing with a math problem that's vertically aligned with one number on top of the other number. With kiddos who are print readers, sometimes we teach them to line up the place values. We might even teach them to take lined notebook paper and turn it sideways so they can put one number in each column to keep things stacked. In Braille, it's really easy to keep things stacked because every digit and every cell is always the same width. So you can't write two numbers above one number by mistake, which makes it a little more clear for our Braille readers to keep their columns lined up. Some common principles to think about when we're doing spatial arrangement is that in Nemeth code, when there's a spatial arrangement of a math problem, we are always going to put one blank line above the beginning of the spatial arrangements. So we'll start, we'll have a direction that might say solve these problems or add these numbers. And then at the end of that direction, we'll start our Nemeth mode. We'll use our switch indicator. Then we put a blank line above the spatial arrangement write all of our spatial arrangement problems. We might have several on the same line. We might have multiple lines on them. They will always have a blank line above the section and a blank line below the problem and the section. The equals lines or the separator lines are made with dots two, five, and they're always one cell wider on each side of the longest line of the problem. Doesn't really matter what problem type, that's kind of a universal thing. We're gonna put our equals line under it. It's gonna start one cell before the widest line. It's gonna end one cell after. If you need to insert any spaces in the math problem to line stuff up, go ahead and do it. This is one of the places in math where you can add spaces that don't match the print to keep things aligned. Mostly it's important to line up the stuff, whatever the stuff may be. So if this is first grade arithmetic, you're gonna line up the place value and the ones column is all gonna have the ones in it. The tens column will have the tens in it. The hundreds column will have the hundreds in it. And out in front of all of that will be your plus sign or your minus sign or whatever. If you are in high school algebra two and you're solving polynomials, you're gonna line up the terms of the polynomial. All the X squared terms are gonna be lined up all the X terms are gonna be lined up, any Y terms are gonna be lined up. Doesn't matter that they'll be different sizes depending on what number is multiplied by them, you're gonna line up the terms because that's what's important to solving it. We need to compare the X squareds to the X squareds in the polynomial. If that means that there's three spaces after it before the X term, that's okay. Put the spaces in and line the stuff up. If it's the units, the centimeters, the feet, the degrees, line up the units. If there are decimals, line up the decimal points. I even teach my students to say, decimal minus decimal equals decimal, decimal plus decimal equals decimal, so that they remember to write the decimal point in their answer with their addition and subtraction at least. Commas get lined up. Any indicators like open fraction and closed fraction get lined up. The fraction lines themselves get lined up. All the things that matter get lined up vertically. Numeric indicators that dot three, four, five, six at the start of a number are generally omitted throughout spatial arrangement. Because we're lining things up spatially, we know we're doing math. We know we're dealing with numbers here. There might be some letters in the mix, but we are not gonna need our numeric indicator especially often. We will just be able to braille the number as a dropped number in the lower half of the cell and know that we mean what we mean. There's some alignment to pay attention to horizontally across the page. If you have a bunch of problems that are similar types, think like a time test in an elementary arithmetic math worksheet where there's 50 addition problems on the sheet. You're gonna have multiple problems on the same line to save space. There needs to be one blank column of cells between problems on the same line. Even if their equals lines are on different lines, if the problems overlap side by side, there has to be a full blank column between them. If the problems are numbered, like problem one, and then there's the problem, problem two, and then there's the problem, then before the problem number, there need to be two blank columns so that you can tell that that's going to be a problem number and so that all the problem numbers are set off from all the problems on either side and you don't accidentally add in problem number two as a digit in your first problem. 
So one blank line between problems that just appear in a list, two blank lines before a problem number, and then one blank line after the problem number before you write the problem itself. And that blank line is a whole column, right? So if, if problem number two, period, and then it ends, then you have a blank space, and then the start of your equals line, which is down on the lowest line. So you're gonna have some extra spaces at the top line. Lots of planning, lots of forethought needed to get all of that lined up correctly. If you're doing it digitally, it's easy to go back and add a space. If you're doing it on a Perkins Braille Writer, it is not so easy to go back and add a space. So planning becomes more important there. Here are some addition, subtraction, multiplication problems of the general alignment. So our first problem says three plus seven. You can tell that our equals line is one cell longer on the beginning and the end. To braille that on a Perkins Braille Writer, we start our top line with a space for the equals line and a space for the sign of operation before we write any number. So there's always two spaces in that top line. If the top line is longest, it'll only be two spaces. If a longer number appears later in the problem, you will also need spaces for each extra digit in that other line. Your second line always has at least one space. It may have more or less. It may have a sign of operation and then some spaces, depending on whether the top line is longest or the second line is longest. And then at the end, your equals line, those dots two, five are going to go from before the plus sign all the way past the end of the number, one extra cell on each side. So it gives us kind of this nice look, three plus seven. The next example says 719 minus three. You can see kind of that difference there in the dot three six for the minus sign and the dot two five for the number three. It's subtle, don't let your fingers drift. And then our equals line again is longest. Notice that we inserted spaces for the place values that don't appear in that number so that everything stayed lined up and our minus sign stays out in front directly in front of whatever the first digit would have been. Here's a multiplication example, 3.5 time, 3 times 2.5. Here's an example with money where we've got a million dollars plus $7,500. Notice that we've got our dollar signs lined up. So when we're brailing our answer, we're gonna have dollar sign plus dollar sign equals dollar sign. Our commas are lined up. So when we're brailing our answer, comma plus comma will equal comma and we'll end up with a nice easy to read number. Note that problems do not need to have all the same type of operation. Here's one that says 10 minus 7 plus 12. So I can have multiple signs of operation stacked out in the front where I can tell what they are. So that's the gist of how spatial layouts work. And they're pretty consistent and pretty straightforward in terms of writing them to show a student how things line up. You would commonly see this on a pre-made worksheet or in a textbook. This is that a similar thing just shown in the print. So if your brain looked at that previous page and thought, wow, that's just a swimming mess of dots. I don't see how they're lined up. This is all it's doing, right? So the three is stacked over the seven. The nine is stacked over the three, um, and then there's blank space where the seven and the one were. Um, this ended up being times in the previous slide, um, but we stacked up the decimal points, we stacked up the numbers, and in our problem with money, we stacked up the dollar signs and we stacked up our commas, as well as stacking up all of the place values. I would even say that if they were aligned, but there was not a comma in the second number, we would have left a space there so that all of the place values stayed aligned because the goal is to line up all the things. If you weren't gonna line up all the things, you wouldn't write a vertical problem. You would just put the two numbers next to each other on the same line. So when you're lining up the multiplication, there is one note you need to be aware of that's different than addition or subtraction. And that's that the multiplication sign is always going to go right next to the multiplier, right in front of it. There won't be extra spaces to align that out in front if the digits are different lengths. So we're not gonna insert those spaces. The problem alignment for multiplication is just going to follow however the print was aligned because in multiplying the place value is 
less important to how you solve the problem since you're just going to take every digit through every other digit. As you're getting those answers as you do the work, that part you would line up down below the problem. As if you were doing partial products, we'd stack those for addition to make it easy to add and keep the place values relevant there. But in the multiplication problem itself, they would just be aligned like the print. So whatever your second number is, your multiplier, right? We have the multiplicand and the multiplier. That's going to get the multiplication cross or multiplication dot or whatever right in front of it. So if the numbers are a different length, it might fall underneath the top number. If the numbers are the same length, it may still fall out in front, and that's fine. And however it's stacked up, what's important is that your equals line is still one cell wider on both sides. If you had to carry or do any regrouping and you were actually working this problem on a Braille writer, then you would use that regrouping line up above the problem to show what things you were adding above it, and that would be dots two, three, five, six. Uh, and that would be the same length as your equals line. But just make sure that multiplication does not need to be spaced out in front, whereas traditionally we would write the plus or the minus sign out in front of the widest column so that it's easy to find. Fractions can be added vertically in Nemeth, and I would argue are way more fun to add vertically in Nemeth than they are in print, right? So one half plus one fourth in print, it could be written vertically. You don't really gain anything in print by doing it vertically, other than maybe room on the right to do scratch work if you're going to convert to common denominators. When you line it up in Braille, everything actually lines up, right? So you've got your indicators lined up, you've got your numerators lined up, you've got your fraction lines lined up, you've got your denominators lined up, and you've got your terminators lined up. In the case of multiplication, where you actually multiply the top by the top and the denominator by the denominator, that's actually super helpful, right? So that, that plays out a little bit better in fractions for us Braille readers. Division. You may have noticed the last section was just on adding and subtracting and to some extent multiplying. But division, our friend, oh, division, we love you. Long division may have given you a headache in school. Your Braille readers may need to see examples of how long division works and what it is. If that's the case, if they need to see a worked example as part of instructional content, there is a way to Braille out division symbols that are spatial and long division to go with it. The core of our division symbol is this kind of O shape, which is why I say O division to help you remember that our long division symbol is an O. The number that we're dividing is, of course, inside the bracket with an equals line on top. And the number that we're dividing it by goes out in the front. If this problem were being written on a worksheet and the student would answer that problem on another page, the equals line would not be included in the Braille. We only add that when we're going to go ahead and do the work to solve it. Right, so here's an example where there is a solution shown above, so the equals line would be necessary there. Uh, but I really just wanted you to see this alignment that the equals line starts over the O, which is one digit ahead of the number it applies to, and it ends one space after the number that it applies to. So again, it's one longer on each side, but the O kind of takes up that length on the front. It also makes the visual shape that a long division symbol is, which is another easy way to remember it. So if we're going to do long division on a Perkins Braille Writer and Braille it out, or if we're going to do per long division as an example problem to show a student how long division is done by their sighted peers, this is what that might look like. I have the problem set up here ready to solve. I know it's ready to solve because I have drawn an equals line over the top. My problem is 2,145 divided by five. And now we're gonna see if I can do long division on the internet. So I check how many times does five go into two? None. How many times does five go into 21? It goes in four times, I hope. Uh, with that, I write my four above the one of the 21. So I'm keeping my columns lined up exactly as you would in print. I write the 20 down below to subtract it, and I put an equals line. 
Now, if I put the subtraction symbol here, I believe that the equals line needs to go one before that. It is also pretty common in long division to not actually write the minus sign every time. And if that's the case, then you didn't write it, then the equals line would always just be the same length as the bar on top because it would always start before the widest line and end after. Sometimes we also see them getting kind of shorter and shorter as they go as you deal with fewer and fewer digits. But that technicality is far less important than subtract the number and figure out what comes next. So we're going to subtract from that 1 minus or 21 minus 20 is 1 and then I'll bring down the 4. How many times does 5 go into 14? It goes in twice. I take away the 10 that is 5 times 2 is 10. 14 minus 10 is 4 and I bring down the 5 from that last place so that I can keep going. 9 goes into, I'm sorry, 5 goes into 45 nine times. And so there I get my answer of 425, which honestly I have not checked, but I hope is right. That's an example of long division. You might see long division like this in a textbook to show a student how it works. Do students actually do long division like this on a Perkins Braille writer? Maybe not. As you notice, as we went through slides, every time I added something, I had to add it to the top line as part of my answer and then come back down and put what I was subtracting, right? And then I'd figure out that part and I'd have to go up and write a number on the top and come back down and write it. That is a lot of scrolling up six, seven lines, writing, lining up a digit to add and then scrolling down six or seven or eight or 10 lines to do the next piece. That amount of scrolling up and down and up and down and up and down and lining up left and right and left and right and left and right is prohibitively difficult. This does not add to a person's ability to solve the problem. So while we show students these are the individual steps, this is how the steps are working mathematically, we line up this whole bottom section to be aligned for subtraction to show that that's what's happening. This is not actually how Braille readers solve division problems. Abacus is the way to do that. And Abacus is a tool that unlike a calculator does exactly zero math for you, you have to know all the math facts, you have to apply them correctly. All an abacus does is jot down that scratch work as you go for every intermediary step until you get to the answer. So generally blind students will set up the problem, do all of the solving on the abacus using the abacus as their scratch paper instead of their braille writer as their scratch paper, because it's more efficient and doesn't require crazy amounts of scrolling and alignment, solve it on their abacus and write down the answer. You might have a student who needs to show all of the steps of their work on one of the problems on a homework so that the teacher can see what it is, or maybe if they're getting a lot of things wrong on a homework, come in to go over it with their math teacher and show their math teacher their steps so the teacher can analyze what step are they missing, what corrective instruction do they need, those are certainly reasonable accommodations, but arithmetic is solved on an abacus because an abacus is our scratch paper. As a TVI advocating for your students, it's important that you understand that an abacus does not do math. An abacus is just scratch paper where you write down your intermediary steps and flipping the beads up and down to jot down the steps is way more efficient than scrolling the braille paper up and down. So that's why we use an abacus for elementary math. In this kind of whole family of spatial things, I think tally marks usually fit here. Depending on what curriculum you are following, you may see this in your textbook later. It may be separated out. Long division may be separated out. That's okay. This can be a foreshadow of good things to come. Tally marks in Nemeth are dots four, five, six. They are grouped with a space between the fives. So if there's one, two, three, four, and then a crossbar in the print tally marks, we don't cross them in Nemeth. We do five and then we do a space. So you can still easily tell that it's a full set and you would only ever have to check the final set to make sure it's full. So no crossing, we just group them. Throughout the context of spatial arrangements, I want to remind you that if there is anything that's omitted, 
Um, whether that's shown with a question mark or a box or a circle or some other kind of blank on a children's worksheet in Nemeth, blanks that need to be filled in, blanks that need to be figured out, blanks that show that something is omitted are a full cell. Use a full cell. Canceling and carrying comes up in arithmetic instruction, especially as it's popular to teach many methods for solving things. There is a formal way to braille in Nemeth that something is canceled or something is carried. It uses the open and close format that's common to other Nemeth modifications. You see it in how we do square roots. You see it in how we do fractions. You see it in all of the modified shapes and arrows and compound geometric modifiers. This uses kind of that format. It's a little bit simpler. So the opener is dots two, four, six. That's like an OW shape. The close is a one, two, four, five, six, which is an ER shape or is the same as the close for a square root. You have to shift everything around to keep it lined up. So if you're going to cancel a term in the top of a problem, like an addition problem or a subtraction problem, I guess, uh, you would have to add space for the opener before the thing to be canceled and the close after the thing. And that space has to be added to every line of the problem. So if you've started working your math problem and now you want to cross something out, you would have to rewrite every single line of the math problem at that time. On a Braille writer, this is not useful. Like, it's too difficult. So this is not a useful problem-solving strategy, but it does get used in the transcription of instructional materials, right? Where you would show a student how to borrow or you would show a student how to cross something out and regroup. For that reason, you need to know how to write it or how to recognize it when it's written. Your students need to have it explained to them when it comes up in curriculum so that if it comes up on a state standardized test, you know, identify what step is wrong in this problem we show you, they need to recognize that that is something being crossed out and carried. But again, when they do actually solve math problems, they'll do their scratch work on an abacus because that is the efficient non-visual tool for the task. Here's what it looks like, though, when canceling. If I take the problem 713 minus 9, I might want to cancel because I can't take 9 away from 3. I might want to do some regrouping and borrowing. I might want to cross out the three and make it a 13 when I borrow one over. Uh, and I might want to cross out the one and identify that that has now become a zero. To cross out my three, I need a cancellation indicator before and after it. And then I would write up above whatever I'm replacing it with. To cross out my one, I would need a cancellation indicator before and after it. And I would write up above what I am replacing it with. My seven, I didn't cross out or replace, so that would just stay the same. I could then subtract 13 minus nine and put the four down below, zero minus nothing and put the zero down below, seven minus nothing and put the seven down below, and have my answer. It would be kind of weirdly spaced out, and then I would probably have to cognitively put it back together or rewrite it back together. But notice that I had to rewrite the second line of the problem to keep it aligned and not have the nine suddenly be directly below the one. It's enough movement over that my columns would have lined up again, but they would have lined up in the wrong place. Um, and I also had to rewrite my equals line to make it long enough, which as it happens, it is out of alignment in the PowerPoint, but that's just the nature of trying to do Braille outside of Braille software. So please forgive that. Those are my highlights for everyone trying to be succinct about the main formats of how to transcribe math problems that are spatial, that are that vertical lineup. It's used instructionally, especially in the early grades and arithmetic as kids are first learning to use their abacus and they're learning what those individual steps are to solve problems. I encourage you to be familiar with it and to recognize it. I hope that you can hang your hat on the importance of lining the, the like things up from top to bottom so that you can work them individually and apply that to many different formats of spatial math problems that you might 
see in print or in Nemeth. As always, take a close look at the individual examples in your textbook and let me know if they raise any new questions for you. Until next time, happy brailing!